Good morning from British Columbia, the Sunshine State of Canada. Good afternoon, the people um, Eastern Time Zone and also all our guests from all over the world. Greetings to you. I want to use this opportunity to welcome you all to this webinar under the platform of Canadian Association for Global Health. You're welcome to this um, forum where we have so many of so many speakers that are going to handle this topic on climate change and health, the Nigerian perspective. My name is Ngozi Joe Ikechabello. I am a PhD candidate in the social dimensions of the health program at the University of Victoria. In this forum today, like I said earlier, we'll be talking about climate change and health, the Nigeria perspective. Welcome once again, all our guests, all the participants, the team, Nigeria-Canada Research Partnership. You're all welcome. The development of any nation is largely determined by the health of its people. And one of the greatest resources of Nigeria that holds a great promise is the people. With more than 350 ethnic groups, a population of 206 million, with a male to female ratio of 1.01, operating a decentralized kind of, a decentralized federal system of government. Nigeria has 36 states and a federal capital territory. It is estimated that by the year 2100, Nigeria's population will reach 733 million people. And that will make it the most populous country, the third populous nation after China and India. When we come to the demographics and the socioeconomic uh, challenges of Nigeria, this has contributed to climate vulnerability. It has contributed also to national development in Nigeria. Nigeria is one of the major emitters of greenhouse gases. But still, is one of the 10 nations that are vulnerable to climate change, to climate changes. And these are related to extreme weather conditions, rising sea level, and increasing land temperature. Further, we can relate this to a rising population, unplanned migration internally, with consequent regional and global destabilization, and also an uneducated youth population who are employed, and this further drives security challenges in the nation. Of note, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed an inadequacy of the Nigerian institutional system to confront and manage emerging global and national health threats, of which climate change is one of them. We're going to see the facilitators and the guests that are going to talk about it. And we are going to see it and we're going to listen and we ask questions. But one thing is obvious, we can leverage on the Nigeria's policy, such as the Nigeria policy on climate change and one health strategic plan. These two policy documents are imperative for addressing eco-social threats, challenging the health and well-being of Nigerians. These policies authenticate initiatives that border on capacity building and research. That affects capacity building and research to action approaches via local, national, and international partnerships affecting the optimization of responses, even to challenging climate crisis. Now we talk about the initiatives. The Canadian Association for Global Health, CAGH, 
is a community of global health workers. Their aim is to provide a better and a healthier world. With their country partnership initiative, the Nigeria Canad Canadian Research Partnership became its newest addition in the year 2021. The NRCP, I'll call it NRCP. NRCP is made up of the Nigerian Coalition for Eco-Social Health Research and also the Nigeria Working Group. These two mix up the country, um, CAGH Country Partnership Initiative initiatives. NCHR, which is the Nigeria Coalition for Eco-Social Health Research, was initiated in 2018 as a community academic-based response of four municipalities that were affected, that are affected by flooding in Nigeria. Also, the academic initiatives that is part of NCHR are two tertiary institutions known as Chukwemeko Dimebu Juku University and Namdiazikiwe University in Anambra State. We also have other private uh, stakeholders that are involved. When you come to the Nigerian Ooh. Working Group, it's an informal group. Hi, thank you. Nigerian scholars across Canada who came together in 2019 about the challenging concerns of climate change and health in Nigeria. Like I said earlier, the NWG and the NCHR make up the Nigeria-Canada Country Partnership. And this is a fulcrum to explore the linkages between climate changes and health in Nigeria via participatory research work efforts. Notably, NCRP was enabled via the platform of CCGHR, that is Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research. And CCGHR was, um, is a, another global health organization in Canada before they merged with uh, CSIH to become CHI, CAGH. Like I said earlier, talking about the policy documents of Nigeria, because of its plan in those policy documents talked about technological efforts and transfers across multi-levels of the society, as well as adopting international negotiations to respond to climate change adaptation and mitigation responses for the benefits of Nigeria communities. And this is part of when we're talking about climate justice. Additionally, that concept, the concept of climate justice, comes to mind to justly divide and equitably distribute the benefits and challenges of climate change, as well as sharing the responsibilities. When you're talking about climate change, you remember that a particular region contributes most of the climate, um, most of the uh, global uh, greenhouse gases, while another region is affected. When you're talking about climate justice, we have to share the responsibility. With this in mind, we are hopeful that the community of climate practitioners of the, NR, on the, of the NCRP Nigeria and in diaspora will contribute their part to address the impact of climate variabilities on health and across other sectors in Nigeria. I'm going to hand over to our facilitator. Our facilitator is here. She's eager. She's ready. <laughs> Prior to migrating from Sub-Saharan Africa, <laughs> from Nigeria, Hawa was a journalist. Also, she lectured and an environmental enthusiast. With her passion in development work, she's currently committed to climate change advocacy. Hawa, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, hello, all. Uh, let me just get my screen uh, available for sharing. Oh, yes. Okay. One, one here. Don't. Okay. Hey. 
one sec on here. Okay. Hello and welcome to the very first webinar hosted by the Nigerian Working Group and Affiliate of the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research. As um, cleverly stated, I mean, <laughs> flattery stated by uh, Ngozi, my name is Hawa Kasim, and I'll be your facilitator today for this webinar. And with me are uh, three um, environmental uh, enthusiasts, and they will make up the speakers for our webinar today. But before we begin, I would like us to start with a poll. So kindly let us know if you think it is possible for Nigeria to meet its commitments to the UN COP 2030 goal. Literally, that is about eight years from now. Do you think this is possible? While you're trying to give me a yes or no answer, I would um, move over to let us know what um, the house housekeeping rules are. So um, I would like to enjoin you guys to please uh, keep your microphones muted. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type it into the comment session before the question and answer session will open up. And um, it has, I was wondering, have we been able to, to all answer the poll questions? Have we? Because I would like to see the results. It's basically a yes or no um, answer. Do we have the results in yet? Yeah, the poll is on. I'll just end it now. So, okay, let's um, see. I'm sharing the results, so. Oh, amazing. So, most certainly 20%, probably 40 and unlikely 40%. Well, it's a good thing that uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a tie there. That is, uh, it's a bit, uh, it's, it shows an optimism in our mind. Well, if you call me um, an optimistic person, you won't be wrong. Because I believe with the 20%, that this is doable. Uh, it's only impossible if it has never been done. But right now in Nigeria, locals are already taking lead to say green energy is possible. And uh, to um, bring home this point, I will just show you a few people that are already doing great things as far as the green energy journey is concerned. So my first, on my screen here, okay, is uh, Mustafa Gajibo. Mustafa Gajibo recently, oh, sorry. Mustafa Gajibo recently um, retrofitted some cars, that some buses actually, that are powered by electricity. They can drive up to 200 kilometers on fully, when fully charged by solar panel. Uh, next on my list uh, is Hadi Usman. Going by the dictionary definition, Hadi Usman is illiterate because he has not seen the four walls of a classroom. But nevertheless, this gentleman here has been able to build a water powered stove. And the next on my list is um, some students of the Federal Polytechnic uh, in Kede. This is situated in in the east of Nigeria, and they were able to successfully um, create a vehicle that is solely powered by, by um, electric vehicle, which is very impressive. And next on my list here is Shagun, who is a university student of Yobafamu Awolowa University. He also retrofitted this Volkswagen that operates on both wind and solar energy. So um, the question that comes to mind is, if individuals without government support can do this, what stops our government from tapping into their know-how and collaborating with them 
to mass produce this green machinery, if we'll call it that. Uh, this and so much more we intend to discuss on today's webinar. To set the session rolling, I would like to introduce my first speaker, uh, Professor Olushola Olufemi. Uh, uh, she is um, an independent consultant with specialty in urban and regional planning. She has over 30 years experience in educating and researching as it concerns this sector in Nigeria, South Africa, and Canada. Uh, I'll just stop sharing my screen and you can take it from here, uh, Dr. Olushola. Thank you very much, Awa. Uh, good day, everyone. Can you see my slide, my screen? Yes, we can yeah. see it, Shola. Okay. So my task this morning, my name is Olushola Olufemi, and my task this morning is to present the overview of the report of the Nigeria Nationally Determined Contributions to Climate Change. But while presenting this overview, I would also like to discuss what is at risk in this document. The objectives of this report is just to give an overview of the regional disparities and the sectoral impact of climate change on Nigerian communities and Nigerian people. Um, it also discussed the risk and co-benefits cool re regarding climate change as well. I'll be giving an um, insight into the practical implications of climate change and health for the communities because the focus of the Nigeria-Canada Research Partnership is on climate change and health. The vision of the report is that by 2050, Nigeria will be a country of low carbon, climate resilient, high growth circular economy that reduces its current level of emissions by 50% and probably ultimately reducing it to net zero emissions across all the sectors of the community in a gender responsive manner. But the problem, the problem is that there's increase in greenhouse gas emissions in almost all the sectors of the economy. But the, the, the biggest emitters are the energy sector and the agricultural and forestry sector. As you can see in the pie chart, uh, it shows the breakdown, uh, the contribution to the national greenhouse gas emissions uh, the million tons carbon dioxide emissions per sector of the economy. And so the problem that this um, projects on the country, on the different regions, is that the waters are poisoned or contaminated. We have polluted skies. The landscape is degraded. Um, there's increase in loss of life, lives and livelihoods, and also energy paralysis. As you can see, I think in the past week, the grid has collapsed, and so there's erratic in, uh, electricity supply. Specifically, in the document, the policy commitments are to eliminate kerosene lightning by 2030. Um, we are all aware that most of the population, they use kerosene for either for cooking or for heating um, purposes. And also a greater uptake of bus rapid transit. This focuses on the transportation sector to increase more transit using the pu more public transit and affordable pu public transit for its people. Also a 50% reduction in the fraction of crop um, and implementation of forest programs and initiatives to, to, to deliver 20% greenhouse gas emission reductions and to enhance removals that's approximately 74.2 million metric tons carbon dioxide emissions. Also to mainstream gender across all the sectors. And we can see this in the National Action Plan on Gender and Climate in 2020. So those are some of the specific policy commitments in the document. The targets, however, based on the COP26 climate talk, 
is that there should be net zero emissions by 2060. But as it relates to Nigeria specifically, their target is to have the unconditional decrease of 20% against 2030 business as usual with projections. And these are some of the terminologies used in the document. And also the conditional reduction of 45% using the same metric dependent on, upon the international financial and technological support. And you can see in that, um, the map of Nigeria, the, the, the various breakdown of how or what they want to reduce or the target they want to achieve by 2030. However, there are two reports that we are focused on. The one that was recently released is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the sixth assessment report, which is over 3,000 pages. But basically what this report is saying, it highlights the global temperatures are poised to rise by 2.7 degrees centigrade by mid-century, substantially higher than the preferred 1.5 degrees centigrade, more than the pre-industrial temperatures that was pledged in the Paris Agreement. Such a rise in global temperature will increase severe climatic events as we have continually experienced and there will be far reaching ramifications on urban populations. And also the IPCC report recognizes the interdependence of climate, biodiversity and people and the integration of that with natural, social and economic sciences. But the emphasis is that there's urgency of immediate and more ambitious action to address climate risks, especially as it impacts on people's health, whether it's on the global level or the Nigerian community. Now, coming to the regional disparities, that's the map of Nigeria, and it tries to show the six geopolitical zones. Now, these geopolitical zones are, are impacted differently by climate variabilities. But the most impacted are the Northeast, most vulnerable right now, Northeast, Northwest, and the least, or the least vulnerable is the Southwest. Now, let me just break this down in a few seconds. In the Northeast, we have the Lake Chad Basin. And that's a source of lively, livelihood to many people. And the Lake Chad Basin has been shrinking over the years because of the impact of climate change. There's also drought and farming and desertification, especially in the Northwest and Northeast region. So we see rising heat, reduced rainfall, increasing and frequency of um, sandstorm and heat waves. But coming down to the Southwest, South, South and Southeast, the variability of climate change is also different um, in these regions. For example, in the Southeast, there's soil erosion. In the South, South, you see the Niger Delta, um, the River and Rhine area being increasingly polluted and the, 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 the loss of wetlands the mangrove forest is declining and you see displacement of people and communities. So as we see the gender and um, the regional variabilities, we also see the gender variabilities. Women are most impacted because women are the custodian of most of these communities in the Nigerian context. So what is at risk? Everything is at risk, if I'm gonna say that. Human, plants, animals, the environment, the health of the planet is at risk. The social fragmentation caused by displacement of people and communities. People are moving from this, especially in the north. You find that farmers are being displaced of their farmlands. You find that pastoralists are moving down south to seek pasture for their cattle. So a lot of communities are being displaced and food security, water security is being threatened because of sea level rise in the south, south, because of soil erosion in the southeast. There's energy imbalance, natural systems, uh, natural resources are degraded continually almost every day, and the ecosystems and biodiversity is being disrupted. So that, that's the broad picture of what is at risk. Coming to the sectoral impact of what is at risk, you have these different sectors, um, housing, people are dependent on generators, which is not sustainable. And this is because of the erratic electricity supply. That's the housing sector. People are ventilating their houses 
with um, um, air conditioners just to keep the house cool. But all these things, there, there's the hydrofluorocarbons that is being emitted, the coolants and refrigerants that we use in the housing sector or even the commercial and industrial sectors, they are all emitters of greenhouse gas into the environment. We see urban sprawl, the cities are sprawling, urbanization of poverty is spreading. In the transportation sector, you have cars that are vehicles that are not roadworthy, trucks that are not roadworthy, breaking down, leaking oil. In the food and security, um, water and waste sector, you also see that there's a lot of contamination of the water, contamination of the soil, and this impacts on food production, it impacts on the agricultural sector. So you have climate-induced hunger and drought. And also, this affects the economy. Nigeria is Africa's biggest oil producer with fossil fuels accounting for 60% of the government revenue and 90% of foreign, foreign exchange earnings. The oil and gas industry is, very, is a very important part of the economy and it's going to be for a considerable time. But then these resources are not renewable and these resources are being bastardized um, as it is and are being impacted by climate change. So the impact of climate change on water scarcity and food production is, is visible, is palpable in the community because of flooding, because of drought, and because of um, land degradation. And I've also mentioned the, um, the issue of um, Lake charge. Lake charge serves about 70 million people, even beyond Nigeria. You have um, countries like Chad, Niger, Sudan, Algeria, Cameroon, and Central African Republic, depend, depending on Lake charge for livelihood, for water. So 8.4, 84, I'm sorry, 8.4 million people right now in all those regions are being displaced by climate change impact. So we have to think about that. And so the greenhouse gas emission is a real thing. It's something that we all experience every day um, in the Nigerian context. So I put this image or these pictures here just to illustrate the impact of climate change on cities, settlements, and the infrastructure. A point, an example that I want to pick up from here is the Ogoni land um, in the south, southeast of Nigeria. The cleanup, that, that area has been de devastated by oil spills, oil pollution, gas flaring, and the mangroves have been declining, the mangrove forest. This is a very rich region. But you see that the cleanup of this community, of this region, is going to take 50 years to complete. And this is based on dwindling resources, lack of financial um, access to financial resources to even embark on these cleanup activities. At the COP26, the Nigerian president said the country needs a cumulative of $1.5 trillion over 10 years to achieve an appreciable level of national infrastructure stock. Um, this is huge because a lot of infrastructures have collapsed based on climate change impact in Nigeria. So let's, let me talk briefly about the impact on health. So when you have increased fossil fuels, hydrofluorides, and the short-lived climate pollutants in the environment, in the air, or in the water, in the system. It impacts on the health, the health of people. It impacts on the heart, the lungs, and some other reproductive aspects of the human being when it comes to human. So we are talking of chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. We are talking about childhood pneumonia, stroke, heart disease, asthma, breathing um, respiratory problems, and reduced lung functions. So you see that we have to take action when it comes to reducing these emitters in our environment. The, the, the short-lived climate pollutants, they are very powerful climate forces in the environment because they come in form of black carbon, they come in form of methane and hydrofluorocarbons, like I mentioned earlier. And they, they warm the atmosphere and cause disease and premature deaths of people in the environment. The impact on, on plants is also something that is very important because they cause plant cell damage and they reduce crop production because they impede on the photosynthesis um, process in plants. 
So while this climate change impact, the pollution of the environment, the, the, the increase in fossil fuels um, emanation in the community affects plants, it affects animals as well, and it affects humans. And so we have to, um, I, I, I read recently that some of these things were detected in blood samples by scientists. Um, the plastics, for example, was detected in blood samples. And I think that is something that we have to worry about. There's also defined particulate matters that is in the air um, all the time from industrial and commercial activities. So um, we cannot do justice to this subject in one hour or in 10 minutes, but just to give us an overview that the health impact affects people's mental health. It causes anxiety um, among people because they don't know when the next sandstorm will occur or when the flooding will occur or what is going to happen to their businesses or their homes or their, or, or their farms. So this causes anxiety amongst people. So my final slide is the way forward even though my, the next presenter is going to give us um, a breakdown of the mitigation and adaptation strategies. But I want to say that um, the, road, the road to achieving ecological res resilience and building a sustainable future with a healthy people and healthy planet um, is a tedious road. It's a tad, t um, tedious, tenuous, and tasking road. But if we come together collectively, we can start working to reduce the carbon emissions. We can work, we can start coming together to achieve the net zero emissions. We can come together by learning from our experience or the experiences of people that live in these communities and apply some nature-based solutions um, into all this to improve the quality of life of the Nigerian people. So thank you. I'll leave it to my next then my next colleague to talk about the adaptation and mitigation strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olushola. Uh, one thing that spoke out to me there, uh, jumped out to me there, is that you said everything is at risk. Unfortunately, it's not something we can wish away without taking action. So to talk about the uh, strategies and the adaptability, I have with us um, uh, our next speaker, she is the per in, in the person of Ogochuku. Then, then I mean, your last name is a bit, uh, you know, part of the degree. Okay. And she is a global health research uh, researcher and a doctoral candidate in international development and global studies at the University of Ottawa. Um, her research and teaching interests are in the areas of maternal health inequities, gender and inclusion, knowledge use, and healthy policy. Hello, Gochuku. Hey, thank you, Howard, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I will- um, Recording in progress. I will proceed to share my screen, share my screen, share my screen, share my screen. Oh, Joyce, I seem to be having a bit of issues here. My computer seems to be frozen, so let me try this again. Well, technology, don't they have the yeah, downsides? I actually have a backup plan just in case this happened because it's happened before. So Christiana, if you wouldn't mind. So it's on here, but it's not letting me like take further action. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, while you're trying to sort that out, I mean, if do we have any question for the uh, for Dr. Lushola, if anyone is willing to ask any questions, let me see if I have any questions. Mm -hmm. chat box. Well, no one has asked a question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We'll wait for we'll wait for the questions would be at the end. 
uh, Christiana is handling it. Christiana is going to show us a ghost slide. Nice. Are you able to show it, Christiana? Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay, uh, while you're working on it, um, I want to use this opportunity to reemphasize that the NRC powered by powered by uh, the Canadian associate um, uh, the CH CAGH aid a typical um, and we need the capacity building for global south researchers by global north nations like Canada to assist um, the IDRC so um, we like I said we can't wish the problem of climate change away so one of the things that could help us as a people meet this global endemic uh, be able to meet the 2030 goal is if we can work together as 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 as, as one body not just okay uh, we can work intercontinentally and some of this um, partnership involves uh, funding helping to give aid to the global south and also helping to you know provide technical know-how to see that uh, we are able to meet up the 2030 goal. In the meantime, it looks like um, Okochuku's um, slide is ready. Am I right? Yeah. Hey, take it away. All right, thank you so much for being here. Um, and Christiana, thank you. Uh, so I will be discussing uh, the NDCs as Nigeria's nationally determined contributions and um, the adaptative and uh, mitigation, mitigation uh, strategies included in the policy document. Uh, next slide, please, Christiana. Okay, um, you may have heard my uh, the previous uh, speaker talk about um, you know net zero. So I wanted to sort of demystify that term a little bit um, because I will have to admit. Um, the one thing about climate change that I particularly like is that it, it's not an issue that's um, just for you know experts. It's not an esoteric topic. You know, like anyone that's uh, interested and has a passion, uh, that's even seeing the impact it's having, um, has a stake in this. And so I, I feel it's really an important uh, area to discuss, and there is a lot of work to be done. Um, and so in this document, I will be discussing an endurance plans uh, for, you know, for climate action and building a resilience uh, community. So historically, and I think it, one of my colleagues mentioned this, uh, Nigeria has contributed little to the stock of greenhouse gas emissions um, that leads to human induced climate action. That's in the, in the grand scheme of things, like in the, at a global scale. However, Nigeria is uh, playing its part, uh, is committing to playing its part. Uh, COP26, uh, the president did announce that Nigeria will become a net zero country. So this you know, evoked a climate emergency. But this net zero term, what does it mean? Are we talking about absolutely um, you know, eliminating any sort of uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Um, in reality, that is not realistic. Uh, so the whole thing then about net zero is reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and bringing it down uh, to as close to zero as possible. And uh, the strategy then involves uh, creating carbon sinks uh, that capture carbon. So for instance, through forestation or through technologies, and then also then reducing emissions. And I'm going to talk about that in the mitigation and adaptive uh, strategies that Nigeria has um, put forth in this document. Okay, thank you. We we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so this slide is, I'm, you know, sort of recapping on what my colleague had mentioned, uh, what Nigeria's priorities are. So first of all, it is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by by twenty percent, and this is under business as usual. 
Um, however, with, uh, con with funding or with, con with uh, support from the international community, like uh, Hawa had just mentioned, uh, Nigeria has the ambitious goal of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 47% below uh, business as usual. So the graph uh, is showing you what it would look like with the, with the uh, blue arrow. This is without any sort of support. So this is the non-conditional and non-negotiable goal that Nigeria has. However, with, uh, with support from the international community, Nigeria is hoping to get it down to 47% percent which is what that's uh, which is what the uh, orange uh, uh, line and arrow shows okay, next slide please so, um, Nigeria's current greenhouse uh, gas emission um, as of 2018, this is showing you uh, the sector that contributes the most, or I guess emits the most uh, greenhouse gas in Nigeria. And this was as well um, mentioned by one of my colleagues. Uh, so we can say that the energy sector is really uh, the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Nigeria, um, followed, followed by the agricultural sector. Um, there was actually supposed to be a poll about this. I'm sure it was missed in all the technical, but yeah, oh, there it is. Oh, that's, <laughs> I kind of gave you the answer already. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, so the energy sector is, you know, the largest sector. And so I will be talking about, um, you know, like the, the strategies across the three major contributors. So the energy sector, the agricultural sector, and the waste sector. So I'm going to be discussing what Nigeria's plans and strategies are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions across these three major uh, sectors. Not to say that there aren't strategies, of course, for the other sectors, there are for waste and industrial, industrial waste as well. Um, but I'm focusing on the three major um, um, culprits. Okay, next slide, please. So Nigeria faces the challenge, right, of uh, producing an adequate energy for the country um, while at the same time minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this will absolutely require investments, regulatory control, and use of low cost but e efficient technologies. So mitigation strategies in the energy sector uh, specifically uh, were proposed across subsectors, namely the residential, uh, transportation, electricity generation, generating sector and the oil and gas sector. And you may have had my, heard my colleague mention this as well. So here I'm focusing exclusively on strategies that call for the abolition, like complete elimination of uh, certain energy sources because I was quite um, you know, curious about that. They're, they are quite ambitious goals. Um, so at the residential level, um, the, the plan is to eliminate kerosene lightning by 2030. So this is eight years from now. Um, in terms of electricity generation, the plan is to eliminate diesel and gasoline generators for electricity um, generation by 2030. And at the oil and gas sector, the plan is to have zero gas flaring by 2030. Um, it's noteworthy though that these ambitious uh, goals are conditional. So conditional in the sense that um, they will only happen if Nigeria has extra supports. Uh, so, you know, Nigeria is not bound to this without the support. Um, so I, I, I guess it's, it's a really important sort of aspect of, of, these, um, of these ambitious goals that Nigeria has. Um, implications of these on health and well-being, again, just recapping on what my uh, colleague had mentioned. Um, in, in this sector, if all these goals are achieved, then we're reducing uh, primary vulnerabilities to diseases caused by air pollution, uh, for instance. Um, in, in terms of the transportation, we're having more access to efficient transportation and increasing uh, green jobs. Next slide, please. And so the next sector then, the second sector that has um, the largest contribution to greenhouse gas emission is the agriculture and forestry and other land use uh, sector. So this report emphasizes nature-based solutions um, that protect biodiversity and also sustainably manages the ecosystem while at the same time contributing to achieving multiple sustainable development goals so, um, and also enhancing food security, water security, and re reducing um, disaster risks and improving livelihoods. So in the agricultural sector specifically, uh, climate smart agriculture is a key mitigation measure. Um, 
in climate smart agriculture basically means an integrated approach to managing landscapes. Uh, agroforestry is a specific type of uh, climate uh, smart agriculture. So this is a land management system where trees, crops, and animals are grown on the same piece of land. And it holds the, the benefits of reducing methane emissions from livestock and provides an option for uh, carbon fixing. And um, implications of this strategy, as I had just mentioned, is enhanced food security, for instance, like using these, uh, this climate um, smart agricultural strategy. We're also looking at increased agricultural productivity and improving income. Um, also, uh, Nigeria has embarked or is embarking on uh, reforming and improving its forest management practices. So for instance, uh, with ending illegal firewood harvesting, uh, that's one of the strategies that Nigeria is uh, going with and also prom promoting the efficient use of uh, forestry resources. Next slide, please. And the waste sector then is the next sector. So it's the third uh, largest emitter of greenhouse gas. The priority here in this uh, sector is um, to reduce uh, waste. So um, emission of waste include, you know, like burning, open burning, treatment of liquid waste and disposal of solid waste. So these are the sources um, of, of waste in the waste sector. So, here, the priority then is to reduce waste by 10%. So 10% reduction in methane emission from organic solid waste through diversion to composting. Um, Nigeria is also committed to having a more circular waste society. So this just means uh, maximally using all materials and having a lot less uh, waste. And uh, Nigeria is taking action to reduce uh, short-lived uh, climate pollutants that my colleague had mentioned. So like black carbon, methane, um, hydrofl hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, and all of this in accordance uh, with Nigeria's ob obligations under the Kigali Agreement. Next slide, please. So beyond uh, the NDCs, beyond Nigeria's uh, nationally determined contributions, um, Nigeria is contributing or committed rather to building a climate resilient society by harnessing technology across various sectors. Um, so these uh, strategies were gleaned from the country's climate change policy response strategy, which uh, my colleague had mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, <clears throat> excuse me. So in the energy sector, for instance, so these are just like various examples. There are a lot more examples, of course, in the, uh, in, in the um, reports. Again, this is the climate change policy response strategy, but I focused on certain, um, certain sectors. So in the energy sector, for instance, um, you know, there, is, there is the look at promoting targeted research in low carbon uh, technologies and renewable energies. In the agricultural sector, uh, there is the plan to adopt scientific and technological innovations to minimize climate, climate risks. For instance, um, you know, looking, using technologies that would address land degradation, for instance, or looking at, at technologies to help uh, build, develop drought resistant crops. Um, there's also enhancing the adop adoption of innovative technology for water reuse, because, um, you know, um, back to the waste sector, this can be like a strategy then to use, you know, water in certain instances. And in Nigeria's coastal area, which one of my colleagues mentioned as well, there are, a lot, there are significant vulnerabilities in that area. So um, the strategy then is to use technology to develop storm and flood preparedness uh, plans in coastal areas. In the transportation uh, sector, there is the plan to promote the use of efficient transportation. Um, so through the use of things like, you know, electric vehicles. Moving on to the next slide, please. Okay. Oh, next slide, please. Thank you. And Nigeria also has a national action plan on gender and climate change. This was developed in 2030 by the Federal Ministry of Environment. Uh, this report is very important because it recognizes that women are, it recognizes that women are disproportionately affected by climate change. And so um, even though they are you know, responsible for, for the majority of, uh, of the land, so they have a lot more vulnerabilities. And 
so a lot of strategies were proposed. Um, one very important thing or something I, I need to highlight is the representation of women in you know, decision-making around uh, issues of uh, climate, climate change. Um, so there are a lot of uh, strategies that were um, targeted across sectors. I don't necessarily have the time to go through all of them now because I've been told I'm way over my 10 minute limits. Um, but across uh, various sec sectors, uh, there are plans to uh, mainstream gender and to have gender issues considered across the, uh, you know, the, food, the food sector, the energy sector, uh, transportation sector. And so I will, um, okay, so what's needed to support climate action. This is a recap of what's been mentioned, just transition, having a just economy is important, um, recognizing you know, issues of uh, gender and also recognizing the youth and the act active role they can play in um, driving climate action. And so I will actually just round up completely now. You can just skip to the very last slide. Uh, okay, so thank you for listening and I will be happy to answer questions at the end of the speaker panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ogo. Uh, that was a very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, it is um, very interesting that uh, Nigeria will be able to go beyond uh, the minimum expected um, achievement, um, minimum expected 2030 goal by the UN if it gets all the support it needs. Uh, this is where um, institution like the International Development Research Center can come in. We cannot overemphasize the need for partnership from uh, the global north, whom uh, in all fairness, uh, consume more of this, uh, um, what do you call it, emits more of the greenhouse gas anyways. Well, it's one thing for us to keep talking about the problems and what have you, and it's another thing for us to seek out solutions. And this takes me straight to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Mrs. Damaris Okafor. Damaris is a research and a PhD candidate in engineering sciences of Estonian University of Life Sciences in Europe. Amongst other first and master's degrees, Damaris also holds an MSc in bioresource technology from the University of Alberta in Canada. Um, Damaris, you're still muted. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. I hope you guys, everybody can hear me now, right? We can hear you loud and clear, Damaris. Go ahead. Thank you. Along the line, it got frozen as usual, and I try to fix it. So, have you ever wondered a world devoid of uh, greenhouse gases? Do you really think such will be possible? Join us in today's presentation so that we look into the strategies or ways we can achieve this greenhouse gas emission completely to zero percentage or zero decrease. And in order to achieve this, one of the major reasons behind this is because we do not want the greenhouse gas effect on the climate change, which is dangerous to us individually and collectively. Join me, my name is, um, I hope the slides can move <laughs> because it was frozen before. Perfect, so. So as the facilitator mentioned, my name is Demaris Yopakor. 
I'm a PhD student in engineering sciences at the um, Senior University of Life Sciences and a BSc holder and MSc holder in food science and technology and MSc holder in bioresource technology. My presentation today on this webinar is on the NCROP way forward. What is the way forward? From the previous presenters or speakers who have come to the point that there are major sources of these greenhouse gases. And these major sources are one, the energy sector, and secondly, the waste sector, and finally, the water vapor. Because this water vapor at the end of the day is being trapped and they maintain the global warming we're talking about because they are trapped in the atmosphere and they hold it in position, thereby leading to the global warming. So, but the first question that is very important is, why is it that the Nigerian-Canada Research Partnership are so much interested in this greenhouse gas emission strategy, so reduction? The major reason behind this action is because of the Paris Agreement or the Paris Accord. We call it Paris Accord because the whole world gathered together. The issue of climate change is not an individual thing. It's a general problem. It's a global problem. So in order to solve this problem, globally, there was a meeting in Paris, and we call that Paris Accord. And what's the objective? The objective is to drastically reduce greenhouse gases or the global temperature to two degrees centigrade or lower, like 1.5 degrees centigrade. And what's the objective? The aim is to make sure that the global warming is drastically reduced. And then the dangerous climatic effects or impacts will be mentioned in all this work will be abetted. Having said that, another reason is that by the time you reduce these greenhouse gases, the air reduction will reduce the global warming. And if you reduce the global warming, then the global temperature is automatically reduced. And achieving reduction in global temperature is ultimately enhancing the global health. So, Another major reason is because we said the energy sector is responsible. That energy sector that is responsible is because of our dependence on the fossil fuel. And this fossil fuel is never re renewable. Okay, if there is no greenhouse gas problem, if there is no other problem, we have a problem with the fossil fuel that is depleting constantly because it's not renewed. So they will lose our ability to have the, such energy. And what do we do by that time? Hence, the need for alternative sources of fuel to enable us to get prepared when it is not there. And we have this inescapable increase in the global population growth. It is also another reason why thinking of alternative ways of achieving reduction in global greenhouse, in greenhouse gases as well as energy source is essential. So, what are the plans of going forward? What are the NCRP plans going forward? The most important thing that everybody should know is that the fundamental restructuring of our society and our economy is the major thing that we need. And the next thing we need is decarbonization. Because if we decarbonize our system, then all the gases I've mentioned, methane, they are all carbon dependent. All the sources of um, greenhouse gases that are coming from the West, carbon dependent. All the sources of gases that are coming from the energy sector, carbon dependent. So decarbonization is important. And this decarbonization is what will lead us to net zero or reduction in the energy, in the, in the carbon emission. And that is why we call that zero carbon or net zero. Having said that, what and what are we gonna do? as NCRP, the Nigerian Canada Research Partnership. So what we need to do is to focus our attention on green energy sources or clean energy, all known as renewable energy. Of course, we know all the way from geothermal, the one from wind, from different sources of energy. The solar, we are so abundant in that, but we're not utilizing that much in Nigeria. And the big question is how do we achieve it? It is by using these alternative sources that we have in Nigeria. We have so much. The whole world, or some, some parts of the world are so jealous of us. 
And it also involves dwelling into biofuel production. When we talk about biofuel production, we have ample resources for biofuel production. We have farms in Nigeria, we have lignocellulose. When I talk about lignocellulose, I talk about all the grasses, all the trees we have in Nigeria, the lignin, the cellulose, converting them to energy. It is not only energy, to all that green sources, green things. There are certain things we use this fossil fuel to do, even in medicine even in our everyday today materials we use in the house. And they are not biodegradable, so to speak. So we need to get the ones that are biodegradable. So we also have to come up with waste reduction strategies, waste reduction strategies and diversion strategies is very important. Which part of it has to do with the curation of waste collection centers? Why is this important to us? This is important because only 44% of Nigerian waste is collected, which means 56% is uncollected. So where are they? They are here, here and there in the street, waiting. They are just bombs, ready, dead, producing the greenhouse gases for us because they're not even ready to degrade tomorrow. And even the little that degrades, it means excess carbon. So to decarbonize Nigeria, we need to do that. We need to look for alternative ways of harnessing them into things that are useful. And there are methodologies for doing that. More importantly is that these methodologies for the conversion of whatever we have in Nigeria requires that we train people to do that. Because when we have this waste collected, when we have all these grasses and trees and shrubs here and there in Nigeria, when they do deforestation and they are dumping, the highest they do is to do incineration. They burn it. What are they doing? They also end up reducing, releasing CO2, methane, and all the carbon sources that are members of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, thereby increasing it. So what are the alternative methods of using that? The technological conversion methods, high-tech methods that are available to, to reduce renewable hydrocarbon, which we use in virtually everything, requires that we know the technical how, how to do that. So training is important. And NCRP is poised to look into that direction. Some of these goals are long-term, some are short-term goals. More importantly is that NCRP will create jobs. By the time people gather waste, for instance, by the time people go to the farm, instead of connecting the cow dung scattering everywhere, we use that to produce biogas, which we use. In, in the universities today, we have dormitories. And in these dormitories, we have sewage system because all the things that they deposit there as waste can also be converted and they become source of electricity for the students in the university. We need to look into that. And that will create jobs both for students that are generating the waste and for every other person. Also, we need to create awareness. Awareness curation in Nigeria is, and I think the number one step we need to take because most of all, we don't even know what we're doing or the implication of our action. And finally, capacity development is essential. So these requirements or all these I've mentioned, honestly, they are capital intensive. There's no way we can do that. Because I said, the greenhouse gas problem, climate change problem, the only way forward is restructuring the what? The society and the economy. And this must be done by the government and the individual. But the policymakers all must come together to achieve this. And money is required. We need funding. Also, we need skilled bioresource engineers, technicians, in order to apply these conversion technologies to achieve what we're looking for. And finally, we must create carbon tax law by the Nigerian government. You know why this is important? If you are accountable of the greenhouse gas you have emitted, you will be very serious of looking for alternative ways, eco-friendly methods, methods that do not release carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That is sure. So if you pay for the amount of gases you have released, if you burn generator every day, 24 hours, and you know you're emitting so much gases, what you will do, because you pay, you have to take action. So we need to do something. We need to collaborate. And NCRP, Nigerian Canada Research Partnership, has to kind of collaborate with Nigerian government, the policymakers, in order to ensure that we get this solved, because this is number one problem. Some people will use equipment that are no longer good and thereby generate more carbon in the atmosphere. So decarbonization requires you pay for the carbon you released. And that is just 
the little information we have for us in today's presentation. Thank you, everyone. I hand over to Hawa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Damaris. Um, you were sp speaking about um, the carbon, carbon tax per se. I remember when I was a journalist, I mean, I, I was covering the oil and gas industry. And one mm -hmm. thing I was able to realize is that it is actually cheaper for those multinationals to pay the tax than doing the right thing. I mean, this is something we had, I mean, we just need to look for other strategies to ensure that uh, we hold those emitting this gas accountable. And I was also shocked to realize that about 56% of our waste are uncollected. If that isn't uh, a time bomb, I don't know what it is. Okay, uh, at this juncture, I would like to uh, introduce our commentators. Because uh, what we'll be doing right now is go into the commentary session. And about three uh, commentators. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, uh, Debaris, please? I think I did already. Are you oh. still seeing it? Well, I just see it, so I was wondering. Okay. About three um, commentators were invited for today's event. Uh, we're hoping that they will come in and give us an input on what they have listen to. Um, unfortunately, one of the commentators who is the, um, His Excellency Adeyika Ashekun, the Nigerian High Commissioner to Canada, uh, last minute just told us he wouldn't be able to make it because other um, official pressing issues came up. Uh, nevertheless, we still have two other capable uh, commentators that we believe will be able to do justice to the presentation they've heard today. Um, so at this point, I would like to introduce Dr. Angela Akamwa. She's a, an academic researcher who doubles as the project officer and CEHR. Um, Dr. Angela, are you there? Yes, yeah, see she's there. Uh, may we hear your input, please? Uh, I can see you're there, but we can't hear you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, it's been so interesting. I want to appreciate the um, speakers and the presenters. Um, it's been quite insightful. Um, climate change is indeed um, a serious issue here in Nigeria and just like they've all said, it needs all the attention that we can give it both from the government and um, from the individuals and also I, I agree with them in the area of creating awareness. I think um, a lot of people need to be aware on the effects of climate change and um, as well as you know positive strides that we can take in order to uh, walk towards the net zero uh, level of emission 2030. Um, here in Anambra State, it's been notable that climate change has been causing a lot of problems, especially uh, climate sponsored floods. And this is particular in four communities, lo uh, local government areas in Anambra State uh, and uh, seasonally every year they face flooding crisis. In fact, about 70% of these communities are temporarily displaced every year. And Anambra State has been declared several times, you know, as a state of emergency as it regards to flooding. And this has also uh, brought about a lot of attention. Government has um, made some efforts, but uh, I don't think it's something government alone can do because uh, most of these affected communities are, of course, they are the poor communities that are located at the floodplains of the River Niger. And because of the uh, you know, disparity in you know, the rainfall pattern, that has increased over the years because of climate change. 
it has uh, you know, increased the intensity of the rainfalls. And additionally, because they are you know, geographically located uh, along the river plains, it triggers and increases the impact of flooding on these communities. In fact, their, their, their livelihoods, most of them, you know, it, they're, they're usually agriculturists. Their farms are devastated. You know, they, they become temporarily unemployed and they have a lot of um, issues with um, uh, polluted water sources. And this also has implications on their health. And most of them, are, you know, for over six to seven months, are outside the comfort of their homes. It, the, 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 the flood of 2020 you recorded that about 5,000 uh, people in those communities you know, were displaced and had to stay in IDP camps for quite some time. And of course, you know, the, the condition of those IDP camps are not really comfortable. You know, when you talk about provision of mosquito nets and other things that could, you know, secure their health. And of course, women and children were usually the worst hit in that situation. So I think, um, just like you said, I also agree with you that we need a lot of partnership here, especially from the Global North, so that we could come together to deal with the issue. Climate change is no longer a story, it's at our doorstep, and Anambra State is really, really experiencing it. The heat are terrible, and when the rainy season comes, of course, the floods are equally terrible. So I think all hands should be on deck so that we could um, you know, bring about positive solutions like they've all mentioned, you know, we talk about um, the, the green technology, talk about reforestation, of course. You know, Anambra State has been experiencing um, a lot of urbanization. You could imagine from uh, 2006 to 2018, the population had grown from 300,000 to about 2.5 million. So there's a lot of demand on land for housing units and for other land uses. So there's a lot of deforestation going on. And also there's a lot of um, mining activities and they have to do with sand. And all these things are contributors to you know, climate change that of course will at the end of the day have adverse effect on the environment and health. So I think um, uh, we should really uh, you know, make, make climate change so obvious so that people can get to understand because everyone is being affected, the rich, the poor, the male, Women, everyone is affected by climate change. Thank you very much. So, oh, Angela, uh, that was so in uh, insightful. It's unfortunate that um, you know we are here watching our society crumble from beneath our feet, which is something that um, we all have to seriously think about. What part are we playing individually? Well, um, after uh, we've had what you think about all the presentation and tell and, and the story you gave us about what's happening in Anambra State, I would like to hand over to uh, Priscilla Ofyong. Uh, she'll be our next comment commentator. She's from the private sector and is the head of sustainability and livelihood uh, Zawasel Climate Change Nigeria. Um, could you just tell us what you think about uh, all you've heard today? And if you have any ex experience to share, we'll be more than happy to hear that from you. Priscilla, please. Thank you, Howard. Because of uh, network challenges, I'm communicating with Priscilla. She was in, but network issue. She said, my network coverage has been very poor. I'm moving to another location to see if it will be a bit stable there. So maybe we'll move on to questions and answers. And if she comes in, we'll give her the opportunity to talk. Thank you. OK, sure. sure. Um, so uh, we've heard the problems, the strategies that are on ground uh, by government, and the possible solutions that can be preferred. Is there anything that has been left out or anything you're not really clear, uh, clear about that you might wanna ask questions? Please feel free to ask by indicating, by, by raising up your hand or just outrightly 
Yeah, Dr. Harrison, interesting. Dr. Harrison Madwe Boise. I mean, not that I'm sorry, it's I have horrible names, uh, has a comment. Uh, yeah, you could go ahead. Can you turn off your mic, sir? <laughs> okay, turn it off or on? No, it's fine, turn it on. Okay, good evening, everyone. Let me start by thanking uh, my colleague who drew my attention to this webinar this evening. It's been interesting. Uh, I think I'm enjoying every bit of it. Thank you, Hassan. Kasi, Belo, you've been awesome. Um, let me quickly appreciate the fact that um, I think we have few male participants. So <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's uh, from what I've seen here, we have a few male participants. Uh, kudos to our, our female uh, folks, because I don't know what I'm seeing here. I think people are trying to treat us, the men, especially from this part of the world. Yes, I'm inspired to see our sisters across the globe doing a whole lot of things on climate change. But let me quickly, you know, uh, <clears throat> comment by saying that um, I think a lot more needs to be done because the issue of climate change, despite the fact that um, a whole lot has been written in uh, extant literature, on what is going on globally. Our case in Africa, particularly Nigeria, where I am now, is a different case because in Anambra, for instance, <clears throat> whenever you talk about issues of climate change, even within uh, your, your peer discussions and all that, even among academics, the thing still sound as if it's still a global thing, despite the fact that we are the one that are bearing the brunt of the effects, you know. So uh, I don't know. We've seen, we've had some the discussions, you know, call for support. I think what we really need in this part of the world, you know, in Africa predominantly, is uh, how we can be able to domesticate the, the, the issues around climate change. You know, uh, it, it didn't take the world anything to, to, to get the information around COVID-19 and even <clears throat> prevention uh, uh, methods, you know, to the uh, local person in the in the villages as we have in Africa, you know, because every now and then our people continue to endanger the environment. It is still something that is alarming that in 21st century, especially even in this 2022, you know, uh, before you could you know, realize what is happening. There are so many bush burning everywhere around your environment. Till today, our people still burn uh, bushes around. You know, in Anambra here, we have recorded more than five different cases where people's houses were burned as a result of bush uh, uh, burning. So these are activities that are, uh, you know, caused by we, the people, because of ignorance. That is how I want to put it. You know, because when we are informed, we should be able to understand that um, the world has moved on. We have gone beyond those uh, uh, period where we need to, as a result of uh, uh, one hunting activity or the other, had to burn the environment or burn the bushes around our, our, our residential areas for one flimsy excuses or the other. So please, I encourage the organizers of this webinar, and I still insist we need to come back home and do more to educate our people. Because before we know what is happening, the dangers will be enormous. Every year, federal and state governments in Nigeria spend millions of naira, you know, to rescue our people from one flood activity or the other. No matter how you try to educate our people that these things are caused by we, the people, they don't really understand. This year you still record the same. Let's say you still record the same thing. You know, by 2060, that the global community is looking at, I think. Uh -oh. uh, if we don't do something at home, we may suffer the biggest uh, uh, dangers as long as long as far as climate change effects is concerned. So I'm interested in how we can domesticate the teachings around uh, 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 what we are discussing about this evening. Thank you very much. No, oh, thank you so much, Dr. Madwe Berezi. Um, honestly, looking at the situation, 
it takes me back to Damari's uh, suggestions. Number one, um, uh, what do you call it? Orientation. I mean, education, educating our people, you know, the impact of what they do, how it affects the climate. I don't think we have enough, we have enough uh, information out there. Number two, when she mentioned something about the um, bioresource technologists, as in technologists, I mean, technical people that could help with uh, uh, biodegradation of, of waste and what have you. Then it brings back to mind uh, the issue of how many of us are actually, how many Nigerian children at the moment are actually in the STEM classes? To go in that direction, we have to have more people uh, in the STEM classes. As it is right now, if you have 100 people graduate from the university, almost 80% are in the social sciences courses. I mean, there's this tendency of a lot of people running away from STEM and the STEM courses. If this um, continues, how are we going to get the future people, the, uh, the future generations to um, uh, take on technologies, innovations to help Nigeria localize its strategies to curb uh, this climate change endemic? Um, this question I'm posing to um, Dr. Um, Damaris, what, do you have anything to say about, about um, the lack of STEM people in, in Nigeria? Thank you so much, Hawa, for your question. Um, STEM has been the order of the day. We do not really have much people. And if we do, most of them are mainly males. So, and when you come to that STEM, like here in Canada, I think I'm, I'm one of the, in the University of Alberta, I was, and I'm still, is one of the STEM people, a member, and they bring their people, like we can do that so back home. They bring students from the from high school and they normally come in two sets. Some people in high school that are that are mothers, you know, we have some young mothers here in Canada, for instance, or in North America. And they encourage them all the way from high school. They visit the university, they bring mothers and also people like STEM have participated in that for three years or more, we educate them, we tell them, and this is how they generate people that are interested in STEM. And it happens twice annually. And different schools will come with their bosses and names, and they will be fed just for maybe five hours or six hours for the day, and they will go home. So I think Nigeria, we should um, mimic them and do that. So that we, we, the interest has to come up all the way from high school, from secondary school. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh. Thank you so much. I see uh, Olushei Shola has, is raising up her hand. Olushei, please take the mic. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm a PhD candidate, and this is an interesting um, webinar to me because my research is actually focused on uh, climate change uh, in Nigeria specifically. Um, I'm based out of uh, Toronto. So, um, I'm, tuning in from Toronto, but I specifically wanted to ask a question to Ogo. Um, I, I enjoyed all the presentations, but something also stuck out to me because I am also looking at the gender balance and climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation. Um, my question is, I know you listed some national action plans by 2025 that I'm guessing has been uh, are being implemented and uh, currently in Nigeria. One of them you said was gender responsive budgeting. And I wanted to, try to understand what in, in more practical terms, what does that actually mean? That and in what ways are the government incentivizing women's active participation in waste management ventures? Because that's another big issue in Nigeria. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question, Oluwashi. Um, yeah, I'm quite interested in really the gendered aspect of anything um, and especially for climate change as well. Um, so to answer your question on um, gender uh, sensitive budget and what that means. Um, so from, from this report, a lot of it was looking at um, having sort of like funding set aside as part of you know, your budget for uh, to target specifically issues that impact women. 
Uh, because again, as we know, women are imp impacted differently in the climate change, uh, in climate change issues than, than men are. So they have certain vulnerabilities. So to have that even like worked into your budget and have the funding set aside so that when, the, when it's time for action, the excuse will not be that, oh, well, we can't fund this project because there is no money for it. So if you already budgeted that ahead of time, then um, you're, <clears throat> you're already poised to you know, tackle issues before um, they arise. And something that you mentioned that I wasn't able to get to uh, in the interest of time um, an important point that you brought up was incentivizing, um, you know, like women, for instance, like in waste, in waste management. One of the uh, action plans, for instance, was having women, um, I don't remember the specific term, but like having women collect waste, for instance, and, um, and building some sort of um, economic um, security for women in that, in that area. So like even paying them to do that, or even having that known as an as an option, as a viable option, as a, you know, as a livelihood. Um, so collect waste. I know, you know, growing up in Nigeria, I used to know a lot of people that would collect, collect like plastic bottles off the streets, for instance. So having that sort of strategy, right, that would specifically target women, because as we know, their vulnerabilities are differ from that of men. So having those specific uh, strategies that would target women, um, those were, you know, suggestions that came up. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, you could also um, this um, uh, post, uh, posing this uh, to the speakers. You could also uh, touch on issues you think you weren't able to actually cover uh, due to uh, the limitation of time. If we don't have questions, but in the meantime, I'm still looking out for questions. Also, feel free to uh, type in the comment box. I will definitely see that and. Uh, ask the question in your stead if you if if um, some of us are might shy if there's anything like that well um so yeah yeah we'll still... uh, earlier on uh while we started look emma raised his hand i don't know whether he's still interested to make a comment look emma you raised your hand earlier yes uh, i didn't You are muted, um, Luke. Okay. Are you hearing me now? Yes. You are hearing me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. So uh, why I would have liked to talk, and I have to talk because civil engineering is, in fact, the entire thing you are talking about. And my area of specialization happens to be in water resources and environmental engineering, where we talk about reality on how to protect the environment where we are. So, and at the same time, the practices of individual had a cost this to grow from day to day. And what we do in the department at the university, Chukwelekwaro University, is to see how we prove a solution that is permanent. Our designs and our uh, teachings, research, supervision had been centered rigorously on how uh, we can find a way we, the, the, the rivers could be dredged to start from there. Because if we say climate change, already it has started. Uh, how do we practice this generally? It is a global issue. But persons are running from the lower plains to the upper plains. How do we cop this running about every year? So we, we have suggested several days that the river should be uh, dredged from the sand that had, that had already sit at the top for years. And most rivers in the whole world had never been really dredged up in issue. So we have continued to raise this alarm every day. And Anambra State in particular, where we are, we have the river Niger and we have continuously raise this alarm for the region of the river so that the, the flooding that takes place each year will come to an end. So that as we are talking about the practices to change this uh, story, then we have to do immediate things like this dredging so that men, women and children will not run around every year. So that is my summary. Government need to really come up by supporting this type of proposals, which we have been doing in the university, so that it could be a reality. Not only in number in all, Parts of the world where drinking had never been started. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Luke. Um, that is something of 
of note is unfortunately we, would, we weren't able to get the Nigerian High Commissioner to uh, Canada. I'm, I'm sure you would have taken this um, your suggestion to government on our behalf. Nevertheless, like they say, time runs fast when you're having so much fun. Unfortunately, we have come to the end. It's already uh, 10.30 a.m. my time, which means that uh, we've exhausted the one hour, 30 minutes uh, amount for this webinar today. So on behalf of the Nigerian Working Group, which is an affiliate of the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research, I would like to pass the e-mic, if I might put it that way, to Christiana, a PhD candidate in the University of Northern British Columbia to do a vote of thanks. Hey, Christiana, by the way, she's one of the brain box behind the entire webinar. It's just unfortunate that our pieces has been showing more, so uh, I'll take it over. <laughs> thank you, Hawa. Thank you, everyone. A big thank you to all our speakers and to you, the participants. Uh, we appreciate that you're able to stay for the entire length of this webinar. We hope that you've gleaned a lot and enjoyed these presentations. Importantly, we will not lose sight of the fact that underlying these great presentations is a call to action. And as a community of researchers and professionals, I, I remember in one of Dr. Harrison's comments, he, he talked about the need for us to domesticate climate solutions in Nigeria. And this will be the direction going forward in our upcoming webinars. And remember, this is a part of a webinar series planned to hold quarterly uh, with a goal to steer conversations around uh, what we can do to address the health impacts of uh, climate change in Nigeria. So we will keep you informed uh, on when the next webinar we hold. And this concludes the webinar. We come to the end of it of this presentation today and we really thank you it's a pleasure to have you all with us thank you for attending yeah thank you so much christiana well um while we're at it we can't uh, overlook the role that um dr vic has played in ensuring that this is um, um we all come together to to try to provide this service, I, I would call it service to our motherland, because at the end of the day, not just our motherland, because it's intercontinental, the effect of climate change affects you irrespective of where you are. But I love his major uh, brain and support system for the uh, Nigerian Working Group, and we want to also take this opportunity to thank you, Vic. Okay, in the absence of any questions, I say, we'll call it a day. You do have enjoyed the rest of your day, evening, afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. <laughs>